Hello everyone, I am Libba Beecham, Living History Interpreter and Director of Media and Communications at the Northeast Georgia History Center, and today I am presenting and portraying suffragist and abolitionist Lucy Stone. Now before I begin, I'd like to thank GFWC for inviting me here today to share Lucy's story and to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. I really wish that we could have met in person, um, but I'm so glad that we can meet this way today. So as you've probably noticed, uh, today's presentation is titled A Disappointed Woman, but do not let that lead you to think that Lucy Stone was demure or weak. Uh, in fact, this deep disappointment that she felt due to the oppression of women is what drove her to fight for the equality of not only women, but of everyone. So let's start at the beginning, <laughs> Lucy. She was born in a rural part of Massachusetts that's called West Brookfield, and that was in the year 1818. She grew up as the eighth of nine children by her father Francis and her mother Hannah Stone, who it's important to note were anti-slavery and members of the Congregational Church. And though her family was by no means rich in luxury, she described her childhood as opulent because of her love of the land, the connection to the earth they tilled, and the loving care of her mother. Uh, she depicts her father as being a bit cold, um, very controlling of the family finances. And uh, in fact, one of her earliest memories uh, was seeing that her mom would keep a few coins from the cheese that she sold so that she could have a little bit of her own money since um, her husband did not allow her to have any of her own. And so from an early age, Lucy, she did not like the differences that she saw in the expectations of boys and girls or versus girls. And she wanted to attend school like her brothers and eventually college, but of course, she was told that that was not her place. So uh, she defied these notions uh, as a teenager with hopes of attending a college in Brazil <laughs> of all places, because it was the only one in the world as far as she knew that admitted women. But fortunately for her, Oberlin College in Ohio did begin admitting women and African-Americans in 1843. Her father, did not financially support her college ambitions, uh, so she did have to work. Um, and one of those jobs was as a teacher to earn money for her tuition. She also earned money on the Oberlin campus because Oberlin had a an interesting format that included manual labor on the campus for in exchange for an affordable tuition. But uh, the wages earned were different between women and men. So can you guess who made less? <laughs> Lucy was also disappointed that Oberlin did not treat women and men the same in the classroom. Uh, one example of this was women were not allowed to practice public speaking, for instance. Uh, of course, I did come upon a story in which uh, Lucy creates a women's debate club, and they do indeed host a debate, but Oberlin stops that um, shortly after, as it did get quite a bit of local publicity, as it was such a, a spectacle to see um, women uh, publicly speaking. And another example of this, um, a, a very big disappointment for Lucy was that upon her graduating as valedictorian, she was not allowed to give a commencement speech because she was a woman. She would be allowed to write a speech and have it delivered by a man. She refused. <laughs> so during her time at Oberlin, she was also a student teacher who uh, not surprisingly, earned significantly less payment than her male counterparts. And she did request to be paid as much as the lesser experienced male student teachers, but she was denied and she resigned her position. After learning of this resignation, her former female students rallied for her and even insisted that they would pay Lucy what she deserved. Oberlin eventually did uh, give in to this request and hires Lucy back with higher earnings, 
not only for her, but other female student teachers. So these are some of the early ways that she defied expectations and demanded what she deserved and had these small successes. After her time at Oberlin, she sets out to become a lecturer. This is really Lucy's dream. And she was quite fortunate to be hired by the renowned abolitionist uh, William Lloyd Garrison, who she looked up to quite a bit. Um, she even had a, a portrait of him uh, in her home. And so she is hired by Garrison to write and deliver speeches on abolition. With Lucy's dedication to both abolition and women's suffrage, she struck an agreement with Garrison to speak on both. She would be paid for what Garrison hired her uh, to, to do, and that's speak on abolition, but she was also allowed um, the space to give speeches on women's suffrage, um, but she was not paid for that. With her lecturing in its very beginning stages, she was still someone that gained attention for her oratory style, uh, and especially her personality. She was described as a little meek looking Quakerish body with the sweetest modest manners and yet as unshrinking and self-possessed as a loaded cannon. <laughs> and one story that I really enjoyed learning about was when she was giving a speech to a group that was um, not in favor of women's suffrage. Of course, many of these speeches were like a, almost like a, a show or a spectacle. How many times do you get to see a, a woman speaking, especially about something like um, voting rights. So people would gather to see this, this spectacle, not necessarily support the cause. And uh, it got rowdy sometimes. There were times when there were rotten vegetables thrown at her and lots of yelling. And I recall uh, reading one story in which she very calmly um, just allowed the, the yelling to continue. And then she looks to one of the men who is there with this mob and uh, asks him to escort her outside and being the gentleman and and you know keep in mind this is sort of a, a traditional move um so uh sort of establishing the male and female traditional relationship he escorts her outside because he's a gentleman and she uh, steps upon a stump and continues her speeches yet now she is being applauded <laughs> for this so it's almost like she she put on a good show for them and knew how to win over um, even the most uh, riotous of crowds it seemed so uh, as her career um, as a lecturer grew she of course soon took a leading role in organizing women's suffrage conventions in the north the south and eventually even the western territories of course, given the anti-suffrage sentiments of the time, she was portrayed poorly and ridiculed quite a bit in the media, but in the women's suffrage circles, she was clearly a force to be reckoned with and many people really looked up to her as a, as a leading voice in this movement. She was not afraid to be ridiculed, though of course, uh, in her letters, she does describe what a difficult experience it is uh, to go through, and of course, difficult for anyone to go through. Yet she took chances like, like this time when she committed to wearing a, a very reformed style of dress called a bloomer dress, which as you can see, uh, it affords um, much more uh, relaxed style, it's, it's much more comfortable, it's functional, and yet it's still, uh, still a modest style of dress. Um, and note the shorter hair that she has and the, the pants. <laughs> so this was, while it was somewhat of a fad that never quite took off and had a permanent hold, it did uh, make a statement that even the way that women dressed was in many ways oppressive and did not allow women to freely roam about and can be comfortable in general. So it really was a, a form of communication that served its purpose, but eventually uh, Lucy does go back to wearing her, her long skirts. Now, uh, one of Lucy's well-known stances was that she would, was that, uh, she would never marry. And during her time, marriage for a woman meant submitting her entire independence to a man, and uh, Lucy could never commit to that. 
But then came along Henry Blackwell, an abolitionist and a supporter of the women's suffrage movement who was enamored with Lucy. Um, they courted for two years and wrote quite extensively and had a, a very, very good friendship, very close friendship. And eventually uh, Lucy does agree to marry on condition that they set a, a private agreement, a contract, to ensure her financial independence. And Henry is wholeheartedly supportive of this. So uh, they go on to publicize their marriage ideals of equality and partnership, sort of this proclamation of what they feel marriage should be and what their marriage will be and is uh, in newspapers. And this <laughs> caused quite a scandal. Um, and people were especially fixated on the fact that Lucy did not take Henry's last name. Uh, Lucy and Henry eventually have a daughter, Alice, in 1857, and Alice uh, grows up to continue her mother's work. So uh, Lucy, of course, uh, going organizing all of these conventions and making herself well known. She was also well known to other suffragists and friends with many of them, including Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But her relationship with Anthony in particular did have a, a long falling out that was widely known, especially, of course, in the women's suffrage um, circles. And among the reasons for the split was the question of whether to give the vote to the now freed black men in America. Anthony um, was of the mindset that both women and black men should receive the right to vote at the same time. And Lucy felt that it was more pragmatic to have the black men receive the right to vote first and then women as um, for the time they were living in, it was more likely that black men would be given the right to vote and then from there, it would be um, easier to get the uh, vote for women. This division uh, causes Lucy to create her own women's suffrage party, the American Woman's Suffrage Association, which becomes uh, very popular, particularly in the Midwest, where it's established. And um, through the American Woman's Suffrage Association comes the Woman's Journal, um, a, a woman's suffrage journal that was uh, extremely popular, although a lot, a lot of work. It was during these years that Lucy Stone describes her just utter exhaustion, yet still uh, utterly committed <laughs> to the cause. Uh, speaking of the split between Anthony and Stone, it, it does take years to mend. Um, there were, it, it could be a bit um, petty at times. Uh, I think because they were such close friends that that split um, and the often public comments <laughs> made in, uh, by both Anthony and Stone, um, you know, they would be taken very personally. So it does take some time, but eventually the two do make some form of amends because the two groups uh, form the National American Woman's Suffrage Association in 1877. Now, Lucy never did vote. She did have a chance to vote when Massachusetts allowed women to vote for school officials because it was, seemed, uh, it was deemed as more appropriate for women in that sphere. But when they insisted she vote under her husband's name, she refused. So I think that really speaks to her um, committing to her ideals and even given this chance, finally, even if it's for uh, school officials, something on a smaller scale, she refuses um, to vote uh, under her husband's name. She wants to vote as Lucy Stone. And uh, near the end of her life, Lucy is diagnosed with stomach cancer and she dies on October 18th 1893 at the age of 75 and over a thousand people attended her funeral and that's not counting the hundreds more that lined the streets that day. Um, her legacy of course lives on to this day as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th amendment um, which was ratified in 1920 and that at least her daughter did get to see uh, the success of her mother and so many other women's uh, work. So 
while Lucy Stone, it, it really does surprise me that she is not as well known as Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton or the earlier suffragists like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth. I, I feel that it, it really is um, a, a sad thing. So that's why I was especially uh, looking forward to sharing her life and legacy with you today. And um, without further ado, I would uh, like to introduce Lucy Stone herself as she gives a speech. And this is um, a speech that she did uh, give at one of the conventions. So. I hope you enjoy it, and again, thank you so much for this opportunity to share the life of Lucy Stone. We only scratched the surface, and I would encourage you to um, read her biography and uh, do even more research because there are so many stories that we just couldn't get to today. And thank you so much, and please enjoy this portrayal of Lucy Stone. From the first years to which my memory stretches, I have been a disappointed woman, when with my brothers I reached forth after the sources of knowledge, I was reproved with, it isn't fit for you, it doesn't belong to women. Then there was but one college in the world where women were admitted, and that was in Brazil. I would have found my way there, but by the time I was prepared to go, one was opened in the young state of Ohio the first in the United States where women and Negroes could enjoy opportunities with white men. I was disappointed when I came to seek a profession worthy and immortal being. Every employment was closed to me except for that of the teacher, the seamstress, and the housekeeper. In education, in marriage, in religion, in everything, disappointment is the lot of woman. It shall be the business of my life to deepen this disappointment in every woman's heart until she bows down to it no longer. I wish that women, instead of being walking showcases, instead of begging their fathers and brothers the latest and gayest new bonnet, would ask of them their rights. The question of woman's rights is a practical one. The notion has prevailed that it was only an ephemeral idea, that it was but women claiming the right to smoke cigars in the streets and to frequent bar rooms. Others have supposed it a question of comparative intellect, others still of sphere. Too much has already been said and written about woman's sphere. Trace all the doctrines to their source and they will be found to have no basis except in the usages and prejudices of the age. This is seen in the fact that what is tolerated in woman in one country is not tolerated in another. In this country, women may hold prayer meetings and the like, but in Mohammedan countries, it is written upon their mosques, women and dogs and other impure animals are not permitted to enter. Wendell Phillips says, the best and greatest thing one is capable of doing, that is his sphere. I have confidence in the Father to believe that when he gives us the capacity to do anything, he does not make a blunder. Leave women then to find their sphere, and do not tell us before we are born even that our province is to cook dinners, darn stockings, and sew on buttons. We are told woman has all the rights she wants, and even women, I am ashamed to say, tell us so. They mistake the politeness of men for rights, seats while men stand in this hall tonight, and their adulations, but these are mere courtesies. We want rights. The flower merchant, the house builder, the postage man charges us no less on account of our sex. But when we endeavor to earn money to pay all these, then indeed we find the difference. Man, if he have any energy, may hew out for himself a path where no mortal has ever trod, held back by nothing but what is in himself. The world is all before him, where to choose, and, and we are glad for you, brothers, men, that that is so. But the same society that drives forth the young man keeps woman at home, a dependent working little cats on worsted and little dogs on punctured paper. But if she goes heartily and bravely to give herself to some worthy purpose, she is 
out of her sphere and she loses caste. Women working in tailor shops are paid one third as much as the men working in tailor shops. Someone in Philadelphia has stated that women make fine shirts for 12 and a half cents a piece. That no woman can make more than nine a week and the sum has thus earned after reducing the rent and fuel and such leaves her just three and a half cents a day for bread. Is it any wonder that women are driven to prostitution? Female teachers in New York are paid $50 a year and every such situation there are at least 500 applications. I know not what you believe in God, but I believe he gave yearnings and longings to be filled and that he did not mean all our time should be devoted to feeding and clothing the body. The present condition of woman causes a horrible perversion of the marriage relation. It is asked of a lady, has she married well? Oh yes, her husband is rich. Woman must marry for a home and you men are the sufferers by this. For a woman who loathes you may marry you because you have the means to get money which she cannot have. But when woman can enter the lists with you and make money for herself, she will marry you only for deep and earnest affection. I am detaining you too long, many of you standing, that I ought to apologize, but women have been wrong so long that I may wrong you a little. I have seen a woman at manual labor turning out chair legs in a cabinet shop with a dress short enough not to drag in the shavings. I wish other women would imitate her in this. It made her hands harder and broader, it is true, but I think a hand with a dollar and a quarter a day in it better than one with a crossed ninepence. The widening of woman's sphere is to improve her lot. Let us do it. And if the world scoff, let it scoff. And if it sneer, let it sneer.